Fox 9's Paul Bloom joins us now. And Paul, it was anything but business as usual at his dental office today. Normal is not a word I would use to describe today. More of a surreal scene. The BCA confirming tonight that Jamar Clark was unarmed at the time of this deadly shooting. It still remains a very tense scene, a virtual standoff between demonstrators on one side and police on the other. I am told by the sheriff's office their deputies did provide a secure escort away from this facility. There was some real concern about his safety after these stunning verdicts. The damage to this pop-up camper is truly remarkable when you see it in person. Also starting to think about a family of five tucked in, ready for bed during Saturday night's storms, when all of a sudden, a tree snapped down on top of them. Could you ask for a better showcase, a better way to celebrate our national pastime? It was electric inside this stadium, the weather. Paul, this could have been so much worse. You aren't kidding, Kelsey. We're talking about a tightly packed neighborhood in North Minneapolis. Take a look at Fremont Automotive, or I should say what was once Fremont Automotive. It has now been demolished after flames literally swallowed the business and the vehicles scorched. Somehow, though, firefighters during this two-alarm fire were able to protect some nearby homes literally feet away. I was sound asleep and I woke up to an explosion. Lynn Haying's house literally rattled following the blast inside the auto body shop located just a few feet away. I went downstairs and I looked out my side window and I went, oh, shit, the place is on fire. <laughs> ran back upstairs, grabbed basically my coin purse and my phone, ran downstairs, put on boots and my jacket and came outside. Minneapolis firefighters attacked the blaze both from the air and from the ground. One of their biggest worries, a couple hundred gallons of fuel stored on site with Lynn's house and a couple of others way too close for comfort. I said one of these days it's going to it's going to explode. It's going to blow up. I, I kind of just figured that's what's going to happen. Lynn is so thankful that thus far firefighters have been able to keep flames away from her house and it's just so close. But the biggest problem, water, all of that water has flooded Lynn's basement. Firefighters brought in pumps to help out Lynn. With the body shop deemed a total loss early on, crews made the decision to allow the heat to vent before fully extinguishing the flames. The deputy chief tells us the garage owner, Tony Mixab, escaped with what appeared to be minor burns. He was working on a car on an elevated lift, had a gas, uh, some kind of a gas leak, and then a spark ignited it inside and it kind of ignited. He was transported to HCMC. Lynn, so grateful that no one was seriously injured or killed, and that her house of many, many years survived the close call. I'm alive. I'm safe. At last check, the garage owner was at HCMC in satisfactory condition. I did review the inspection, city inspections over the last five years for this business. A couple of minor violations, but everything was up and in compliance. One last show. This is how close that house was. Lynn's house, literally three feet away from this business. We begin with Fox 9's Paul Bloom live at the 4th Precinct, where the march kicked off tonight. Paul? Kelsey, two focal points, obviously, tonight to demonstrations. You have that scene, that amazing scene downtown where there's some buildings on lockdown, including City Hall, and obviously behind me still at the 4th Precinct, very much occupied. A concert stage has been set up, a musical show of solidarity expected tonight. Now, these actions come on the heels of this frightening incident late last night. Several Black Lives Matter protesters injured in a shooting that some people are calling a targeted hate crime. We get to 14th and Morgan and all you hear is pow, 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 pow. And my brother got shot in the stomach and I got shot in the leg. It went right through, like right, my hit me and went right through. 18-year-old Wesley Martin identified himself as one of the five Black Lives Matter demonstrators who were shot late Monday night. He described the gunman as masked and on a mission to take out protesters who have occupied the 4th Precinct for more than a week now. You lucky? Oh, I'm lucky to be here today, and I'm glad to be here today. His leg bandaged, walking with a cane, Wesley insisted nothing would keep him from what he calls the fight for justice. Uh, I've been out here ever since it started, all day, every day. No justice, no peace! Wesley was joined by throngs of supporters on Tuesday, rallying outside the police station. The demands remain the same, to release the videotapes of the deadly police shooting of Jamar Clark and to make sure that there is a fair and impartial investigation. Protest leaders making it clear that the overnight shooting would not scare them away. We will not bow to fear or intimidation. That's right. 
Black Lives Matter exists to fight against this type of violent white supremacy, right. dangerous anti-black rhetoric, and criminalization of black people. Northside, we outside! The growing crowd filled with many high schoolers who participated in a near Minneapolis district-wide walkout, then took their chants and their demands out onto the streets with a promise to not give up the fight. My next step is to lead the people. And if I got to lay my life on the line and die for what I stand for, I'm going to lay my life on the line because I believe in what my ancestors died for. Fox Science Paul Bloom recently sat down with one of those victims who blames police for not doing more to stop a potential child predator. Not something that I'd wish on my worst enemy even. Troy Cole remembers every second of that bike ride home. The only thing he said was, if you don't be quiet, I'll kill you. November 30th, 1986. This was a life and death situation. Yeah. I, I pretty much thought I was going to die that night. It was a Sunday, a school night. Troy was just 13, and he had to make curfew after hanging out with friends at a downtown Painesville pizza joint. He was a block from his family's house on Stearns Avenue when he was grabbed from behind, ripped off his bike, and dragged into some nearby pine trees. I was petrified, terrified. Troy never saw his attacker that night, but he recalls the guy had a knife, he threatened to kill, and he grabbed the frightened teen's private parts. The last thing the man did was cut off a clump of Troy's hair, took the boy's stocking cap, and disappeared. He told me to lay, lay there in the trees for 10 minutes, otherwise he's going to come back and kill me. So who, I don't even know how long I laid there. I mean, you know, 10 minutes, that's, that's an eternity. Troy and his dad reported the assault to the Painesville Police Department. It would be one of at least eight similar incidents around these small cities downtown between 1986 and 1988. Troy explained that he and the other victims were in a small circle of friends and felt they were being stalked or watched. All of the attacks seemed to involve the same suspect description. Short, heavyset man, the raspy voice, face obscured, hiding in darkness before pouncing. Federal authorities recently detailed the assaults in a search warrant application connected to Danny Heinrich. The question, was Heinrich the person of interest now identified in Jacob Wetterling's gunpoint abduction, in essence, getting more and more brazen in his hometown? These documents reference Heinrich's close resemblance to the suspect descriptions, the fact that his then apartment sat right in the heart of what's now known as the Painesville assault cluster, and that modern DNA recently linked Heinrich to a brutal kidnapping and attempted rape of a young boy nearby Cold Spring during this very same time period. There's too many questions unanswered that should have been answered 29 years ago. Court documents show that the then Painesville police chief actually suspected Heinrich in the unsolved attacks in his community. Troy recalls knowing Heinrich back in the 80s, describing him as a bit of an odd guy who hung around downtown, always wearing camouflage and a baseball cap. The now 42-year-old dad admits he isn't sure that it was Heinrich who attacked him, he recalls a suspect kind of disguising his voice, making it, quote, more staticky to shield his true identity. Something that sticks in your head you never forget. In one sense, Troy explained that he never wants to know who exactly caused him so much pain over the years. He remains frustrated that his community appeared to minimize the significance of the assaults when they were first reported, remembering people mockingly dubbing the attacker Chester the Molester. And with the Wetterlings still so desperate for answers a quarter century later, Troy wonders why police didn't do more to crack the Painesville cluster in time to possibly thwart a monster. My whole name is Jacob Irvin Wetterling. They could have probably prevented it from happening. They wear a badge that says to protect and serve. Why didn't they? They, they didn't do anything. Nothing. I'm, I'm just so frustrated. And Part of Troy's frustration is through all these years, he claims the only time he spoke to an officer or a detective was the night of that assault. He says, in fact, officers never even went to the scene of his attack. I did track down the former Painesville police chief at the time for comment. He told me he just doesn't remember either the time period or the names involved. Reporting from the newsroom, Paul Blim, Fox 9.